Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Baldrige Foundation's quarterly webinar, Practical Steps for Addressing Key Processes and Systems in the Baldrige Excellence Framework. Before we get started today, I want to take a moment and recognize all of our great sponsors and a special thanks to the members of the Mac Baldrige Society, who serve as trustees of the Foundation's Institute for Performance Excellence. Here is today's agenda. Our guests include Kay Kendall, CEO and Principal of Baldrige Coach. And then she will be followed with updates from Bob Thangmeyer, the Director of the Baldrige Performance Excellence Program, Brian Lassiter, the Chair for the Alliance for Performance Excellence, Stephanie Norling, Executive Director of Communities of Excellence 2026, and some closing comments by the Baldrige Foundation. So now I am going to turn it over to one of the most well-known consultants throughout the entire Baldrige Enterprise and a very good friend of ours, Kay Kendall. Kay? Thanks, Al. And thanks for you and the foundation for inviting me to do this, uh, this presentation. As we were joking before the um, meeting actually started, a lot of us involved in Baldrige are absolutely fanatics around process, and so hopefully this will spur some enthusiasm for all of you. The objective is to understand some key terms and concepts from the Baldrige Excellence Framework, really talk of the elements of proactive process management as opposed to the hair on fire process management, um, explore the use of some process management tools, and really take it to the bottom line of improving your organization's performance by implementing this approach. One of the things that I absolutely love about the Baldrige Excellence Framework is the glossary. And I want to remind you to take a look at some of those terms because they sometimes have a slight difference in the way that we use them in normal conversational English. And I think it's really important to understand systematic and effective as the Baldrige defines them. And one of my all-time favorites is key, because I was surprised when Harry Hertz had added that to the glossary several years ago. I kept wondering, why do you have to define key? And he said, because people keep asking for it. I was working with a client many years ago that really didn't understand the concept of key. And I kept trying to explain it to them. And on the second day of the workshop, the regional director of nursing said, Kay, Kay, I finally got it. I understand what key means. I said, oh, that's great. Can you tell us? She said, not every. So that's just a little bit of uh, humor in terms of some of these terms. Okay, why the need for process management, especially proactive process management? I'm trying to figure out how to advance the bullet. Okay, do you ever hire new employees? Do best practices emerge in your industry? Do technologies evolve? Do competitors ever out innovate you? Do customers' requirements and expectations ever change? If you answer yes to any one of these questions, this is why you need process management. So what is proactive process management versus just a regular process management? It requires the establishment of process owners for key processes. It's a management system for defining and documenting those. And the final bullet is really the underpinning of the proactive part is how you have a proactive approach for the regular review of key processes to identify opportunities for improvement and innovation. So rather than wait to have an improvement thrust upon you, you're constantly looking at your processes on your radar screen and seeing, are there opportunities out there, not just for improvement, but for innovation? So what are process owners? Process owners are the people in your organization who are responsible for ensuring that the process is designed to meet related customer requirements. It's the person responsible for making sure that the measures of the process are defined and that the process is monitored for performance effectiveness. And one of the things that you'll find in the glossary definition around effectiveness is the only real person who can determine the effectiveness of the process are the people who serve as the customers of that process. Process owners are also responsible for ensuring that related documentation is developed and that it's approved and updated that appropriate training is conducted, 
And finally, this last bullet is a real key to proactive process management. The process is regularly evaluated and improved, not only when an adverse trend is detected or you've received negative feedback. Process owner is also the person with organizational responsibility for all of the cross-functional areas involved in the process. And it's the only person with the authority to approve changes in the process or its related measures. This is really important, particularly the more cross-functional the process is. So here are some painful lessons learned about process ownership. It's always an individual, never a department or function. I worked for a boss one time who said, she wanted to have one belly button to push. That's really what you're looking for in a process owner, that one belly button. It's one person, not multiple. And this becomes even more important the more cross-functional a process is. And I'll tell you what oftentimes happens is the process ownership keeps escalating until you have someone with the authority over the involved departments. But if that's the COO or CEO, you have the wrong leaders in your, in your organization who won't collaborate for the greater good. Now, sometimes you'll have a metric owner. And what's that difference between a metric owner and a process owner? The metric owners oftentimes work on behalf of the process owners, gathering data, identifying relevant comparisons, reporting the results, identifying adverse trends, and assisting with root cause analysis and recommendations for improvement. But they don't have the authority to make changes to the process or make changes to the documentation. Again. That goes back to the process owners. So what are some principles of process improvement? I think we've all heard this one. All work is a process. Well, yes, it's true. But I believe there are two types of people in this world, people who understand and think in processes and everybody else. And trying to get people who don't think of work as a process to be active in process management is going to be a hard hill to climb but we have ways of making that happen. What we found is that cross-functional processes represent the greatest opportunity because they have the most handoffs. There was a book uh, in the early 90s called Managing the White Space by Rumler and Beige. And they found that, again, those handoffs were the most um, important parts of a process to be really mapped out and understood because they have the, the uh, potential to be real bailiwicks of errors. <laughs> um, processes should be designed to meet or exceed customer requirements. We talked about the need for clear ownership. Procedures document process. And by following procedures, you can look at reducing variation and promoting customer satisfaction by having processes that you, as well as your customers, can rely on operating um, every single time. Some of you may have seen this tool. It's a common tool to describe a process, it really originated in the Six Sigma land. And it starts with the process is in the middle. The next step is defining the outputs of the process, inputs, who are the suppliers and who are the consumers or customers. I honestly would have been, uh, preferred this to be reorganized a bit to be COPIS or in reverse, but I think there was some sense that the uh, acronym wouldn't be very uh, appealing if it was COPUS instead of SIPOC. This is a tool that Glenn and I in Baldur's Coach have developed and modified over time. And I wanna just explain a little bit about how it's used because you might think it looks a lot like a SIPOC and the top part does a bit. Um, but also, if you're in the process of writing applications, this tool could become your best friend, and I'll explain it in just a minute. The numbers have meaning. They should be addressed in sequence. So the first thing is, what's the name of the process? This doesn't have to be very so sophisticated. It could be, oh, hotel guest check-in process. So who are the customers? Well, obviously, it's the guests of your hotel. What are the outputs? Well, we said that the only person who can identify and approve of the effectiveness of a process are the customers. So over here under outputs, we're gonna have what are the customer requirements? So for things like the hotel um, guest check-in process, you might have things like uh, a short wait time at the check-in counter, a key that works the first time so that I don't have to schlep back down to the 
check-in counter to get a key that works. Um, I actually get the room that's of the type and at the price that were specified during making the reservation and so on and so forth. And those would be your customer requirements. Now, the, the fourth step in our, our ideal process would be the guest is handed a, a working key to the room type at the right price that is um, fully functional, it's clean, everything, all the equipment in the room um, works properly. And guess what? I'm a really picky guest. I want the room to be unoccupied when I turn that key. So the inputs, we already gave you a clue on the input. The input was actually made, the requirements were set at the time the reservation was made. And so that's our input. And then in between all of those things are what is technically called the process chunks. Around four to six process chunks that are short with verbs and, and of noun. So it might be arrive at property, um, approach guest check-in. Uh, confirm um, information from reservation at the check-in, be handed a key to the right room. Well, guess what? All of this part right up here, that's a description of a systematic approach. We've got a little box down here for evidence of deployment, the D in Adley, the evidence of learning, the systematic evaluation and improvement or innovation, so that's the L, and at the bottom is integration. How does this process relate to other key processes or systems? And then as a little extra bonus, we've added in some related measures. These might wind up in your results. So you can see how a tool like this could really help you on your way to um, developing your application and making sure that you've defined systematic process, deployment, how you've evaluated and improved it, how it integrates with other processes, and related measures that examiners are going to expect to see. So how do you determine your key work process requirements? It starts with identifying your key customers and stakeholders. The next step is listening to the voice of the customer, one of our favorite processes in item 3.1. The next step requires translating that voice of the customer into measurable attributes of the process, which will then turn into specifications. So this is called a critical to quality flow down, CTQ flow down, which is another tool out of the Six Sigma um, toolkit. And what it is is a systematic process for translating the voice of the customer, product or process design requirements. It always results in something that's actionable and measurable. It's validated with the customer. The weightings are provided by the customer and it's tracked throughout the life of the project. I wanna come back to this next to the last bullet, the weightings provided by the customer. How many of you have received surveys from some supplier or a service provider who asks you how important a certain aspect of that service is? And you're given a one to a 10 with 10 being the highest. Doesn't everything wind up a 10? What the voice of the customer does in a CTQ flow down is it forces customers to actually force rank the ratings. So you have maybe 10 attributes and you have one to 10, but each number can only be used once. So what you're doing is you're getting the customers to tell you in their own words, which is the most important attribute and which is the least important attribute and the rankings all the way through. Otherwise you find yourself into a no-win situation where everything is equally important and you can't possibly manage that. So what are CTQ characteristics? Well, they're linked to a customer need, requirement, or expectation. They're not designers' wish list of things they want to include as new features. Um, there are things that really tie back to what a customer has expressed in some way or another. And we'll get back to that in a second. It's stated clearly, simply, and unambiguously. That's another little tricky point. And we'll talk about how to do that. It describes the what will be met, not the how, this is not the solution, it's just defining what's the specification. So again, specification specific, and it's quantifiable. So instead of saying respond quickly, you're gonna say respond by noon the following day or some other quantifiable way to know whether or not you fulfilled that requirement. So how do we understand customers' requirements? Customers are often unintentionally vague. 
when I worked for Sun Microsystems, I used to teach this process. And one of the things I would ask is, how many of you have ever said your computer is slow? Every single hand would go up in the room. And then I would ask the question, well, is slow a, a, a complicated word? Is slow something that you've never heard of before in English? And of course, nobody thought that it was a complicated word. They all thought it was easy to understand. I said, OK, but when we talk about slow, is it slow from the time you power it on until you get your welcome screen? Is it slow when you're running multiple applications? Is it slow when you're surfing the web? Is it slow when you're trying to switch applications? And finally, is it slow when you're trying to turn it off? How many of you have gotten that wonderful sign out of Microsoft that says, computer updates beginning, do not turn off or unplug your computer. And then you get this creepingly slow, slow percentage of completion that you have to wait for before you could do anything else. Sometimes you have to determine what customers don't want to identify what you do want. Um, I had a friend who one time went to a new dentist and I asked about the experience and he said, I'll never going back there again. And I said, well, why did he hurt you? He said, no, but their waiting room was filthy. Now, I would never have thought to put as a requirement of a dentist that the waiting room be clean. But I understood my friend's response to that was, if you don't see a clean waiting room, what conclusions might you draw about the other cleanliness and hygiene standards that are used in this dental practice? Customers downstream activities or your customers' customers are often important to understand. When I worked in aerospace, one of the last jobs I had was working for a division that supplied um, um, gauges and, and various devices. And so we had one that controlled the air, air cabin pressure. And we only had one customer that keeps sending these back saying they were defective. Couldn't understand it because, you know, we were providing, providing the same gauge and valve to other customers and they were having no problems. So the customer invited me, who was the head of quality, to come out for a visit. Actually, it was a little bit more than a visit. It was a scolding um, because we weren't providing the responses to what was going on with these valves. Well, I'll tell you, I'm not a very large person. And the pilot invited me to come up and sit in the, in the co-pilot seat for our, our flight, which I was just thrilled with. But when I got up there, it's a fairly tight cockpit. And there on the, cons on the console was our valve in, in, um, inserted in such a way that it made it a perfect footrest for the co-pilot. That's exactly what was happening with these valves is they were being used as a footrest. And what required us to change was nothing more than providing a metal bracket over that that allowed the valve to be turned but didn't allow the valve to be dented or harmed in any way with any pressure. And again, remember, not all requirements are equal in importance. And this is particularly true if you don't force your customers to um, weigh in what their requirements really are. So here's an example of a CTQ flow down. It's like a tree diagram. And so it starts out with, this is in healthcare, patient satisfaction. And you see in the green boxes, that next level down. Okay, well, what does patient satisfaction mean? It means I want a defect-free healthcare, I want timely service, and I want affordable. Well, if you look at those three, again, they're not at a level of specificity that you can create measures and standards for performance. It's not until you get the first one, the right first time cure and the minimum wait time that you could actually define with, how long am I willing to wait? Obviously my desired uh, minimum wait time would be zero as soon as I arrive at the doctor's office I've seen. But what's my maximum wait time before I start to get aggravated? It might be 15 or 20 minutes. The other ones that are in yellow have not been sufficiently drilled down so that we've now got to a point where we can do something that's actionable. So CTQ flowdown results in defined units of measure. So if we're talking about slowness in computers, we're probably talking about seconds, not minutes or hours. Although that may in fact be the performance we're currently experiencing. What's the desired level of performance? Again, in some cases, um, the minimum would be zero. 
but the highest acceptable is when the customer is beginning to get irritated, annoyed, or may even think about choosing a different supplier or service. And the other thing you wanna do is looking at leading versus lagging indicators. So think about this again with the hotel room checkout. Once a, a, a guest satisfaction survey has been mailed to a former guest, their experience with the guest check-in process is already done. So you as the hotel manager can't do anything to influence that rating at that time. But what are some of the leading indicators? Could be your cycle time at the check-in desk, could be the percent of keys that are returned because they don't work the first time, could be any number of things like whether it matches the reservation that was made at the price that was, that was quoted. But there are lots of things that you can do before that guest actually checks out to do some service recovery. There's another proactive process management tool. And this is regular reviews of key processes. And we've got standardized evaluation factors and prescribed actions if any factor is less than green. I wonder if you could think about what some of those standardized evaluation factors might be. Hmm, look familiar? Adley, can you look at these processes in the, in the terms of approach? Is it appropriate for our operating environment? Is it systematic? And is it effective at meeting those requirements? How about the deployment? Is the deployment relevant and consistent? Is it deployed throughout the organization? Learning, has the approach been evaluated and improved? Is there evidence of organizational learning? And how would you know? Is there evidence of innovation? I'd like to point out two things on those two bullets. Organizational learning in category four has a wonderful note that describes the attributes of organizational learning. I would strongly encourage you to read that note and also to use it in informing you how you're gonna um, write your response to that. Evidence of innovation, again, you really need to look at the criteria and the glossary for innovation because Baldrige does have a, a rather different um, definition to innovation that may not require you to get a patent or to have something that you file with the patent office. And then the integration is, again, how well does the approach align with and integrate with the organization's needs? So now we're, if we're looking at results, what might we use as evaluation factors there? By golly, it's that well-known and very familiar levels, trends, comparisons, and integration, or let's see. So these are good ways of evaluating the results that we have and seeing how they meet these requirements. So here's an organization we worked with that came up with these templates that they used on their key work processes. They had about 16 of them. And this one was the learning and development process. It was key to them, but it was also one of the Baldridge key work processes. It starts out with what we care about most so that we're not just doing this template just to be doing it. We want to make sure that it's advancing this process and our management of it is advancing what we care about most. And in this case, you'll see that they looked at the objectives against Adley. They looked at the metrics, which were the results against Letsy. And then they identified. So in the Adley part, they saw that they had an opportunity to do a better job with deployment. In metrics, they needed to look for comparisons. And this was a really big um, point for them because they struggled to find comparisons, but yet they knew that they couldn't really um, do true process management without having those comparisons. Or as Carrie Hurt says, are you doing as well as you could? How do you know? It's those, those important comparisons that give you information on that. Now, one of the things that this organization did was they had quarterly review meetings. And with having 16 of these key work processes and related templates, they divided them into four sections. So every quarter, four of their key work processes were reviewed, evaluated, and action plans were put against anything that was not in a green level. So by the end of a calendar year, every one of their 16 key work processes had been proactively evaluated and improved. I'm about ready to turn this back over to Al, but I wanna make one last offer. 
Um, we really are process fanatics, process geeks, if you will. And so if you'd like to have any discussion with us about this proactive process management system, we'd be happy to have a quick call with you or have an email exchange. So please let us help you. Okay, thank you for that outstanding presentation as always. I truly enjoyed it. I learned something every time I listen to you. I learned something new. Um, so that was a, that you. was great. Hey, we've got a bunch of questions from the audience. So I'm going to throw the first one at you here. Uh, what are some of the ways that leaders can prioritize their efforts in this area? We always have a have a bias towards looking at the customer facing uh, processes, especially your external customers. It's really important that if you're going to go into proactive process management, that your external customers feel that improvement first. And then you could move into some of your internal processes. But I'll tell you, the external processes, external facing processes also frustrate your employees. Um, they don't like being on the receiving end of that complaint, of that frustration from that external customer. So if you can help make those processes work more efficiently, you not only get the win with your customers, you get a win with your employees. I like that, yeah. Okay, here's the next one. Uh, what are some of the benefits that you've seen to implementing a concerted effort to manage processes? Um, this might be surprising to you, but we've often seen sometimes the most benefit from very, very small organizations. So we have a client that has 24 employees. Um, they're a small nonprofit. They do phenomenal work. But one of the things that they kind of joke about is rather than if you were hit by a bus, they joke if someone won the lottery. And the fact is that they're one person deep in many of their processes and capabilities. And so by coming up with a proactive process management system for them, it allows them to get those processes documented. It allows them to create a knowledge management system. So if somebody actually wins the lottery, um, they actually have some bench strength behind that one person. So we've seen a lot of success there. Um, the other place that we've seen a lot of success is maybe in an industry that has high turnover. And, and for the same reasons, you're not dependent on a person, you're dependent on a system of knowledge management. Okay. Uh, here's our next one. Uh, what are some of the common barriers and how would you recommend combating them? Um, Honestly, it, it's turf wars, uh, particularly the more cross-functional that the process is that you're trying to manage. Um, you're going to have difficulty when even those senior leaders won't yield to give someone else the final say-so. So one organization where I worked wound up declaring that the process owner had to be the CEO because their direct reports wouldn't form a collaborative relationship. And the CEO um, became very exasperated and said, if it has to be resolved at my level, clearly I don't have the right people in your jobs. Amazingly enough, they were able to find a way to collaborate. Okay. Um, here's another one. Who are some of the Baldrige Award recipients that demonstrate exemplary process management? Well, the application summaries uh, found on the Baldrige website are often just a gold mine of, of good examples, but I can think of a couple. Stellar Solutions um, and Mary Greeley Medical Center and our two-time winner of Elevations Credit Union, um, who really has done amazing work on business process management, and they're very, very generous in sharing what they've done. Okay. Uh, here's the next one. Um, what modifications or differences, if any, do you recommend to process management and measurement in nonprofit versus for-profit systems? We don't really see a need to make much um, much differentiation between for-profit and nonprofit. The the only difference, obviously, would be that um, you're going to have more financial processes that you may have to manage in a for-profit, but even nonprofits have to have money to make their mission. So um, we don't see a lot of need to change those. Okay. Um, here's the next question from Alex and it says, do you have experience with helping companies to adopt external frameworks such as APQC, PCF 
And is this helpful in defining the process management and other key processes? I definitely have experience using the APQC process uh, architecture. I know that it was a big influence on Boeing uh, that was used in both of the Boeing divisions that won the Baldrige Award, one in service, one in manufacturing. Um, so I, I think it's got broad applicability. I think it can be quite honest, a little bit of overkill in very small organizations, but I think it's a great starting point. Start out with it and then weed out the processes that are less important in a really small organization. But obviously, if it can work for Boeing, it can work for very large, complex, and sophisticated organizations. We've got a number of, just a number of questions here, but some of them I'm trying to combine because they're very similar. So um, here's one of those now. Uh, regarding key work processes, if you work in a large healthcare system uh, and you have hundreds of key processes throughout the organization, how would you recommend getting your arms around such a large, complex scope? Um, we, we see that with healthcare, and oftentimes people want to take it down to an individual uh, service offering, and even sometimes the, the various processes that are, that are done in that service offering. We think there's real value in, in bringing things up to a higher level of consideration. So in healthcare, we oftentimes will have four key processes, admission, assessment, treatment, and discharge. Now that may offend some of you that says it doesn't go deep enough. Doesn't mean that you can't drill those down further, but if you were trying to just do a, a a measurement, high level measurement. Think about it from a patient's point of view. Is most of what they're experiencing captured by those four key work process? Admission, assessment, what's wrong with me? Treatment, how are you gonna fix it? And discharge, I wanna go home. So we think again, if you look at it from the external customer perspective, you can oftentimes avoid getting down into the weeds. Okay. Uh, here, the next one's about leadership. Um, what are your tips for getting buy-in from senior leadership, specifically on a need to identify key processes and to have a process thinking outlook each and every day at work? Um, well, having worked in an organization that didn't have that kind of leadership, I can tell you how frustrating it is. But having worked in organizations that do have strong leadership in this area, one of the best ways to get their attention is to ask them what's keeping them awake at night. And usually what that is, is a result of some kind of variation, that the processes are not predictable. And, and then if you can explain how this process management is really designed to make processes predictable, to make their outcomes predictable, to make the customer experience predictable, there aren't very many leaders who will argue with that. Um, they're, they're looking for things. And then the other thing is you have to explain, this doesn't prevent you from doing improvement and innovation. It just ensures that you capture those and again, make them predictable. Okay. We've got time for one more question before we get to some updates here. And this question is from Mahmoud and it's, is there a role for benchmarking in process improvement? Absolutely. And so this gets back into that template that I showed you that had a, a block for comparisons. So one of the actions that we see some of our clients take is they realize they don't have comparisons. So in the Harry Hertz famous question, how do you know? They don't. And so benchmarking oftentimes becomes a way for them to identify how they really are doing. And the, the caveat I would give you about benchmarking is particularly with processes. Don't get wedded to people who are doing exactly the same thing you are. Let them look at something that could be a surrogate. So the example that I often use is when you arrive at, at a conference, what do you do? You register, okay? When you go to a hospital, you get admitted, okay? When you go to college, you register or you enroll or whatever. If you go to a mental hospital, you get committed. Okay, now what I'm really trying to make the point here is each of those processes sounds like something different, but it's really the attachment of an asset to something that someone expected and was promised. So you can look oftentimes at processes that are analogous to the process you're trying to benchmark, 
without having it be in the same industry or the exact same process. We just facilitated some benchmarking among two of our clients on customer service and especially their tech support. Totally different industries, but call service handling was an area that they both could share some best practices and some oops, we don't have a good answer for this one. Thanks, Al. Uh, thanks to everybody for your questions. If Kay did not get to answer your question, uh, we're gonna get your question to Kay and she will answer it via email following the presentation. But Kay, I wanna thank you once again for coming on board with us today. You're always engaging and dynamic. And I always, like I said, I always learn something every time I listen to you. I really appreciate you and, and all that you're doing, uh, not only for those that you work with, but for the entire Baldrige community. Thanks, Kay. Thanks, Al. Uh, now I'm going to turn it over to Bob Fagmeyer, the director of the Baldrige Performance Excellence Program for an update from Gaithersburg, Maryland. Bob, over to you. All right. Thank you, Al. Uh, Kay, thank you so much for that great presentation, presentation on and representation of some of the key concepts of the Baldrige framework. I always appreciate your perspective on things and you always do a great job. So thank you. So my update today is really gonna be focused on the recently completed external review of the Baldrige program, our award, our other offerings, and the efficacy of the larger Baldrige enterprise. And as you see on the slide here, that Rio's partners um, was tasked with a pretty big lift. We asked them to do a very broad review of the program across all of our products and services, the award process, the framework, or our engagement with and relationship with members of the Baldrige Enterprise, et cetera. And they also had to take a deep dive in some areas. We also only gave them six months to do their review. But from our perspective, and I'm sure from many of yours, Getting through the review and being able to move forward was absolutely crucial. That said, it was equally important to make sure that they engaged with all of our key stakeholder groups, including individuals and organizations that are not engaged with Baldridge or perhaps used to be and no longer are. So this slide just sort of gives you a sense of the robustness of that review. Uh, it included document reviews, benchmarking and research surveys, interviews, uh, focus groups, and even ideation sessions. And ultimately, Rios engaged with around 500 individuals. And the final report was just over 200 pages in length. Next slide. So in that report, Rios detailed their key findings. And in response to the findings, they offered 26 specific recommendations. Now, I, I shared before that I believe that the findings will not be a big surprise to those who are familiar with the program and with the, the larger enterprise, and that the recommendations themselves generally make a lot of sense. And those 26 recommendations can be summarized as shown on the slide, and they really emphasize enhancing the program and the awards relevance to our parent organizations, NIST and the department, as well as to the nation as a whole, and the organizations that are perhaps looking to use Baldridge um, as a means to be recognized or improve their organizations. We wanna make the award process and our other offerings more accessible and more appealing. We wanna be able to re-engage with well-known industry leading organizations. We need to strengthen and expand various partnerships in order to help expand our reach and impact and then also enhance the alignment and integration across the members of the Baldridge Enterprise. Next slide. So what's happening next? So since the receipt of the report, we have been working with NIST and the department to develop and obtain approval for our proposal of how we will respond to those recommendations and move forward. And I am thrilled to share that we do have that approval and we are very busily getting started with engaging the Baldrige community and with industry to finalize some of the specifics of the process, um, changes to our products and operational changes as well. Details on the proposal itself 
and how we will be moving forward will be shared publicly. We have some details that we need to iron out. Um, but I do think it's important to, to recognize that we recognize how important it is for the award process to be restarted. And so that is one of the absolute top priorities and is our expectation that we will have the changes designed and fleshed out um, in the next couple months. And then we will be working to stand up the award process for the remainder of this year. We hope to actually be able to engage in the process to some extent this current year, calendar year, uh, but we may not have award recipients um, until sometime into 2024. Don't hold me to that, that is the plan. Um, there's lots to do between now and then, but um, that is what we're working towards and my expectation. And with that, I will finish because we wanted to make sure that we had time for the other updates. And if there's a time at the end, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Okay, Brian, over to you. All right. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Bob and, and Kay. Everybody, thanking to everybody. Okay, that was, that was, I completely agree with Al. I uh, know a lot about process management, but I took notes and learned three or four new, new things from you. So thank you for your time today. I am Brian Lasseter, Chair of the Alliance for Performance Excellence. Um, I have a brief update today, go a little, little more in depth in the next webinar, but for those of you that are not familiar, the Alliance is considered the front door for Baldur's, the feeder system, if you will. We're a collection of 29 Baldur's-based uh, programs and other supporting members that represent all 50 states and many sectors across the United States, all trying to advance improvement and excellence within organizations and communities uh, around the country. Um, this is an interesting story that's not on the slide, but we were uh, we spent most of last year creating our own organization profile, taking our own medicine, if you will, or practicing what we preach, and ran into stumbling blocks with a handful of very key questions, and so which is really fascinating. If you're not using Baldridge or if you haven't written your own organization profile, I highly recommend it. We it works. We had we had a version of the profile that we wrote, oh my gosh, eight or 10 years ago that had not been revised in several years. And a lot has changed in the world. Our environment's different, our, our focus is different, what our what our members need and, and who we serve is different and so forth. So we engaged in what we called a visioning exercise uh, back in January, the board uh, launched um, uh, an exercise and ask all 29 of our members to complete a one page assignment that um, through their lens, through their perspective, would capture some of the fundamental components of who the Alliance is and who we serve and, and uh, what we're all about, if you will. Uh, most of our members, about two thirds to three fourths of our members completed that exercise. We launched a couple of teams, one internal with Alliance members, uh, reviewing the input in blind fashion, one external, thanks to Walden University, a uh, team of researchers looking at the um, same input or same output and analyzing it and generating some common themes and so forth. And that's all come back to the board and we're now synthesizing and, and taking action on, on our future state. Uh, the long and the short of it, is, well, first of all, you're welcome to use that process. It does, it does work. It really formed a lot of consensus and had a, it helped us cut through a lot of the noise and complexity of who we are and what we do. Um, but it got us to what you see on this page. We did not have a purpose statement. We now do, uh, which sits on top of the mission. It's really why we exist and who we serve. And the mission is really the core of our business. You can see the language there. I think what's really important from the Alliance perspective is that we've broadened our scope a bit in, in capturing the purpose statement. We're now serving individuals, organizations, and communities, a deliberate attempting at including communities which is a, a relatively new focus within the enterprise, and we'll hear from Stephanie here in a second, um, across the United States and around the world, which is an intentional expansion of our work. We already have members that serve the international marketplace. We have inquiries and, and other stakeholders that are, are asking to, to work with the Alliance to expand their improvement and excellence effort. So it just made sense. We have a lot of work still to do in the United States. Don't get me wrong but uh, expansion, intentionally expanding our reach across the world was, was deliberate. And then of course, the, the focus on um, performance excellence, learning, implementing and achieving that level of high performance is still at the core of our purpose. Uh, the mission you'll see listed there, I won't read it to you. Uh, the Alliance and our members do a lot of things. We have a variety of different service offerings that help organizations and community either get started in their, in their excellence effort or, or accelerate their journey to excellence. 
So while those products and, and service offerings themselves may change over time, we're really all about uh, enabling, supporting organizational leaders, community leaders as they advance to higher performance. Our vision has not been revised. We're, we'll probably need to take a look at that to see if it's still relevant. And beyond the three statements on the page, we have a lot more work to explore who our customers really are, how they're segmented, what their needs are, uh, what our challenge, strategic challenges are and advantages, what our business models should be moving forward. So we've, we've really engaged in what's becoming a, a full year introspection of who we are and what value we provide as, as we recast the value we provide to our members into the full Baldrige enterprise. We'll go to the next slide, Jerry. Um, Mark on your calendar, if you don't already have it there, one of the products the Alliance does offer is uh, the Baldrige Fall Conference. This year will be hosted in Milwaukee, October 16, 17, and will be streaming worldwide. There's some really uh, powerful keynotes that have just been announced, three, three great keynotes, and the rest of the program uh, soon to be announced. It's great learning, great networking, very high energy. Um, some unique, innovative twists this year with the streaming component with some new formats uh, that go beyond just traditional breakout sessions. So uh, check out the website there, baldrigeconference.org. There's some preliminary information on the website. Registration shall open, should open just about any minute and the rest of the program will be announced soon. So uh, hope to see you in Milwaukee or see you online sometime this fall. So a briefer, announcement, uh, briefer update this time, Al, but I'm happy to take any questions too, if we have time. Brief, but very informative, Brian. Congratulations to you and the entire Alliance for all the uh, things that you've accomplished here. Um, and I'm really excited about Inspire too. Uh, I know that we've received a lot of interest in it so far, and we're uh, happy to help support in terms of sponsorships as well this year. So congratulations again. I think that's gonna be an outstanding event. Uh, I think at this time we'll move on to Stephanie and Communities of Excellence 2026 update, Steph. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and um, thank you for joining us today. If you would go to the next slide, please. Um, I'm also very happy to share that Communities of Excellence has decided to um, practice what we preach, and we have submitted an organizational profile as well to one of the Alliance programs, recently received our feedback report, and are now going through the process of making those revisions. Uh, it was an excellent experience, so I also encourage you all to, to go through that. It really helped us identify some great opportunities. Um, we did also affirm our purpose statement and our envision futures here, which have now remained with us and remain strong um, over the past few years. All right, next slide, please. So the major things I want to share today um, continues to be that we are still opening, have openings for next year's National Learning Collaborative. We're looking for six to eight communities to join our newest cohort. And uh, we are just thrilled with the way that the curriculum is going, the progress that our communities are making um, who are currently involved, and some of the new improvements that we have for next year in the curriculum. We actually, our faculty actually just met last week, had some great ideas, and I cannot wait to get started on implementing them for next year. The uh, Learning Collaborative begins in October. And so we continue to accept applications through August, but please, I encourage you to reach out to me if you're interested and have any questions about what that takes. As we do every year, we are partnering with the Alliance for Performance Excellence and uh, co-hosting the co um, hosting the fall conference. Our theme is also Inspire, and I, I have to echo what Brian said. They have an excellent lineup this year with the uh, Baldrige Fall Conference, and Communities of Excellence also has an excellent lineup, and we're really excited to be opening up our conference to the public as well. So um, much like Baldrige, stay tuned, save the date, keep your eye out for those openings and registration opportunities. Um, and additional information, the Communities of Excellence framework is undergoing a revision right now, and we have been working for the past few months gathering input from community stakeholders, Baldrige experts, community development experts on how to improve the criteria. It's currently been um, updated. A first draft is now out for a group of experts to review, and we will have the new version ready by September, so just in time for the conference and the new collaborative year. Something we're doing new this year is we have brought together 
um, a group of DEI experts from across the country to form an equity task force. And they actually will next week be reviewing the draft of the framework with the lens of equity to help us understand how we can improve and make recommendations on how to improve the framework to make sure that it is promoting equity across the United States and across our communities. So that is my update for today. And um, thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Stephanie. We appreciate all the work that you're doing on behalf of communities nationwide. Um, as a brief and new announcement to everybody out there, um, I just want to let you know that the Foundation's Leadership Awards for Excellence, then those are individual awards, have added a community award that we will soon be sending out to everybody with the parameters for uh, moving forward. Um, I just want to let everybody know that the, today's slides will be available on the internet along with the uh, presentations and um, the video of today's presentation uh, next week, about Monday or Tuesday. Uh, we're showcasing this month at the Institute for Performance Excellence our leadership courses, and a lot of them tie into exactly what Kay had talked about in her presentation. So if you want to take a look at those courses, which are all online and self-paced, please visit baldridgeinstitute.org forward slash education. Again, I want to thank everybody for tuning in today and a special thanks to all of our donors and sponsors who make presentations like today possible. Thank you for tuning in and have a great day, everyone.